as we head into Lent, we're starting a new series on the seven deadly sins. But we're not just talking about the sins, the vices. We're going to talk about the virtues as well and how we can live up to the calling God has given to us. And it's an appropriate series for us to be doing during Lent because Lent, of course, is a time of self-reflection and preparation for Jesus' death on the cross because we can't fully know the joy of Easter without an honest recognition that we are sinners in need of a savior. So we're gonna be spending some time looking at each of the seven deadly sins. It's something that's been much debated over the centuries. It's not a list that you'll find in your Bible, but instead a list that arose in the early church from the monastic tradition. Around the fourth century, the monks put together this list of seven deadly sins not because they were the worst of sins that we could commit or because they'll lead us to hell, but because they're so easy, so tempting to fall into. I don't often wake up in the morning and worry that I'm going to commit murder, but lots of times I know that I've strayed into the sin of, of pride or the sin of sloth and gluttony. So when we study the seven deadly sins, we know that they're sins that are hard to avoid and that we battle on a daily basis. And they tempt us step by step to walk away from God, to forget the image of Christ that's in each of us. So this Lent, we're going to spend some time in self-examination, holding ourselves up to this traditional historic list of sins and finding where we fall short. But instead of just looking at how we fall short and what we do wrong, we're going to look at the complementing virtues as well, the invitation to live life differently. Last week, Jim started us off on this series, and he talked about pride and humility, the first of the seven deadly sins, warning us away from the sin of pride, of thinking too highly of ourselves and putting down those around us, but inviting us instead to embrace humility. Today, we're going to look at the second sin, envy, we're going to talk about what it means to die to envy, to rise in contentment, fighting that green-eyed monster that makes us crave what others have, learning to become content with what we already have. When talking about envy, there's probably no better passage of scripture to look at than the parable of the vineyard workers. It's where envy rears its evil head and the workers become embittered over the owner's generosity. They lose sight of the gifts that they have already received. So I'd invite you to hear God's word this morning from Matthew 20, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for their day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. And about five in the afternoon, he went out and found others still standing around, and he asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. So he said to them, You go also and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. And so those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At first glance, this parable might seem like an odd one. 
Here we have the vineyard owner who goes out and hires workers, not once, not twice, not three times or four times. He goes out five times looking for laborers. Five times throughout the day, he goes into the town square where the workers are gathered and he hires more people to harvest in his vineyard. Early in the morning, he goes nine, noon, three, and then again at five, constantly looking for more laborers. It may seem like an odd thing to us, going out and hiring more and more workers throughout the day. And it makes me wonder, what's this urgency all about? Why did he need so many laborers? A clergy friend of mine speculates that it must have had something to do with the weather. Having grown up on a farm herself, she recalls a time when a hurricane was making its way up the coast and threatened their beautiful apple harvest, threatening to destroy all their crops that they had spent all year cultivating and caring for. And so it was all hands on deck to pick as many of the apples they could, harvesting late into the night by flashlight if necessary, trying to save their crop from the storm. Whether you're talking apples or grapes like we find in our scripture today, we discover that the weather is one of the most important factors in determining the success of a harvest. All you farmers out there know you need enough rain, but not too much. You need warm, sunny days, but not too hot. Farmers stake their livelihood on the weather. Both too much or too little can ruin a crop. And so by necessity, farmers learn to read the weather and to adjust their plans accordingly. So in this case, maybe heavy rains are coming, rains that would rot the grapes and destroy the harvest. And without the benefit of the weather channel to forecast the weather 10 days in advance, the owner would have had little notice that the storm was coming maybe just the winds picking up or seeing the sky darken in the horizon. Or maybe they'd just gone through three days of scorching hot heat and the grapes just couldn't take it any longer. They were dying on the vine. So ready or not, it was time to harvest. Either way, there was urgency here in getting the crops hardest. And it's no wonder that the owner kept going out and hiring more and more and more workers. Because remember, this farmer's livelihood depended on the crops he had right there. He made his whole annual income in one weekend of harvesting. So the stakes were high. And if at the end of that day, he had managed to save most of his crops, was no doubt he was in a celebrating mood and obviously feeling quite generous indeed. We all know what happens next here. At the end of the day, the owner gives instructions on how to pay the workers. Starting with those who were hired last, the foreman pays each one of the laborers one denarius, the wage of a full day's work. Then he paid those who were hired in the afternoon and in the early morning, also giving them a full day's work. Finally, he came to the ones who were hired First, very early in the morning, who had agreed to work for one denarius. These laborers were so excited, seeing the owner's generosity with those who came after them, thinking that if he was so generous with those who only worked one hour, how much more generous would he be with me? I could imagine the buzz that must have been happening among the laborers. If the owner decided to pay those who were hired last for a full day's work, just how much are we going to get? With each worker, they became more and more excited, more and more greedy. But when it came time to receive their pay, they too received just one denarius, the same amount as all the rest. Understandably, they were a little miffed with the owner and began to grumble amongst themselves. After all, we worked 10 times longer than some of those men. We were here during the hottest part of the day. Certainly, we deserve more than they do, right? The owner replied, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. 
Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do that? Or are you envious because of my generosity? Logically, those workers who were hired first shouldn't have been angry. There was nothing for them to get mad about. They received the amount of pay that they agreed to work for. And if it had just been them, they would have been perfectly happy with the pay that they got because that's what they were expecting. But when they compared themselves to others, to those who received more than they did, they became jealous and enraged. That's really the way that envy works. It doesn't always make sense. It's not a logical thing, but this gut feeling we get that grabs a hold of us and just won't let go. We can be completely content with what we have until we look over and see that our neighbor has something that we don't. We can be satisfied with our car and we can love our phone and happy in our marriages until we look next door and realize that somebody has it better than we do whether that's true or not. And we become filled with envy and can consume us. There's truth to that age-old adage that the grass is always greener on the other side. We always want what we don't have. And in its most basic sense, that's what envy is. Wanting what another has. Wanting what we do not have. There's no fun to be had in envy. And some argue that it's the only of the seven sins that there's no enjoyment to be found in whatsoever. You can argue that in gluttony, at least you get to enjoy the indulgences that you spoil yourself with. Or with pride, you feel good because you puff yourself up and you get to look down on other people. There's some fun to be had in that. Or what about lust? None of us would argue that letting lust get the best of you is no fun whatsoever. But it's not the same with envy. There's no joy to be had, no reward, no payment there. Only this bitter disillusionment that eats away at us because we want what somebody else has. Envy is such a difficult sin, such an unpleasant experience that one of the church fathers, Gregory the Great, said that with envy we're so racked by another's happiness that we inflict wounds on our own pining spirit. There is nothing fun about envy, and yet it is oh so easy to fall into. Envy also is one of the most social of sins. While you can indulge in gluttony or sloth all by yourself, it takes two to envy. It's yourself compared to one another that causes the problem. And here as God's community, when we are already connected together socially, it's right to assume that envy will thrive among the faithful. And that as we gather together, that that is something that God's people struggle with. Comparing ourselves to others, wanting what we cannot have, becoming discontent with God's abundant blessings. Envy has the ability to pit friend against friend, brother against brother, making even our closest of friends into our competitors, enemies in our own mind until we become so divided and so filled with jealousy and anger that there is just no love left to be had. And today as we think about envy, as we think about this temptation that's so easy to fall into, we are invited into something else. We are shown a better way to live. And the invitation is to die to envy and the bitterness and self-loathing that comes with it and to rise again in contentment. So give up our need for more and more and instead to learn to become content, to become satisfied with what God has already given us. 
Just by living here in America, we are blessed in so many ways, so many basic things that we take for granted that the rest of the world does not get to experience. Access to stable housing, life without the threat of daily violence and fear, the knowledge of where our next meal is coming from, access to clean water and indoor plumbing, so many things that we take for granted that put us above the standard of living that most of this world experience. And yet still we long for more. We see that our neighbor has just a little bit more than we do and we want it and we're filled with jealousy. And it's no way to go through life being consumed by jealousy. And it's disrespectful to God for the gifts that he has already given us. And even when we find ourselves in times where money is tight, we are truly going without, it is possible even then to find contentment. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 4 that he has learned to be content whatever the circumstances. He says that I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. And here's the Apostle Paul who was beaten and imprisoned and gave up all his worldly comfort for the sake of the gospel, who truly knew difficult times, saying that he found the secret to being content. You wanna know what that secret is? That secret is Jesus. The trick to being content in all circumstances is having something that the world can never take away. The incredible, all-encompassing love of God. And the truth is that no matter how difficult or how challenging or how destitute life may be, that God will never leave our side. That he is our source of joy and comfort, the one who guides our steps and protects our ways and holds us fast even when the world is crumbling around us. And because of this truth, Paul declares that he can do all things through God who strengthens him. And that truth is just as true today as it was in Paul's day, that in Christ we can do all things through him who strengthens us doesn't mean that we can walk through walls or fly or magically predict the winning lotto numbers, but it does mean that God is with us and with God we can get through anything. There's no problem too big or need so small that God can't take care of it. And Paul takes comfort in this fact and we can take comfort in it as well. The secret to contentment is having something that the world can never take away. That something is Jesus. Nothing we can do will ever chase God away from us or make us lose the love that we have of our Heavenly Father. In Christ, we've been given the greatest gift there ever was. And because of him, we have everything we ever need in order to be truly happy. In Christ, we find the strength to die to envy, to rise again in contentment. In Christ, we are truly satisfied. Let us pray. God, I thank you that you love us and that you care for us, that you walk by our side. God, we confess that it is difficult when we see what others have and that we do not. That is difficult to overcome the temptation of envy. God, we ask that you would be our strength, that you would be our rock and our redeemer, that you would teach us what it looks like to be satisfied, to be content with what you have, to give thanks for your many blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.